And like millions of others, I was prescribed sleep equipment. Did you know sleep equipment manufacturers recommend daily cleaning? That's why I use So Clean. It's the perfect complement to my daily routine, and it's hassle-free. So Clean is fast and easy. It keeps my sleep equipment fresh every day without the need for disassembly. With So Clean, daily maintenance is a snap. All you do is place your equipment in, close the lid, and walk away. You can try So Clean risk-free for 30 nights. Order now and get a $50 rebate. So Clean is so fast and gives you peace of mind that your sleep equipment is fresh each time you use it. Call 1-800-637-1472 and for a limited time, get a $50 rebate. Call 1-800-637-1472 or go to SoClean.com. Attention, anyone owing the IRS over $10,000 needs to listen to this important message. The IRS has created a special program that can potentially save you thousands of dollars by qualifying. It is the IRS Fresh Start Program. And since qualifying for the IRS Fresh Start Program is not automatic, we will connect you with a tax professional for free consultation. Once you're accepted by the IRS, they must stop all bank and wage levies. Call Tax Group 123 now at 800-659-6490 to find out if you may qualify for the IRS's Fresh Start Program. My gums are irritated. I don't have to worry about that. Do I? Harmful bacteria lurk just below the gum line. Crest Gum Detoxify, voted product of the year. It works below the gum line to neutralize harmful plaque bacteria and help reverse early gum damage. Gum Detoxify from Crest. My skin gets so tired. This new Olay Serum feels so dewy and hydrated. Gives my skin an extra boost of life. It's full of energy. It finally matches me. I'm Denise Pedro and my skin is powerful. And I can face anything with my Olay. 11 Alive News Primetime on the ATL starts now. Tonight, a closer look at the rising number of COVID-19 cases in Georgia and how our state got here. Among the many victims, a man with a personal connection to Tyler Perry, who died the same day that Tyler Perry carried out an act of kindness for hundreds of seniors. The legacy of Charles Gregory and what he leaves behind. Plus, one in 10 Americans filing for unemployment, but how fast is relief coming? Two local women share their different experiences. Good evening on this Thursday night from in town. I'm Jeff Hullinger reporting from my house. And I'm Jennifer Bellamy at our Midtown studios. Tonight, the CDC is giving us a clearer picture of those impacted by the virus, releasing more information about people hospitalized in the month of March. Out of 14 states studied, Georgia was sixth in line when it came to the number of confirmed cases based on limited testing. The numbers on age line up with what health officials have been telling us that older people and those with health conditions are most at risk, but younger people are also getting sick. 90% of those admitted to the hospital had underlying health conditions, but they are common conditions for Americans like high blood pressure and obesity. Many also had metabolic diseases like diabetes or chronic lung disease like asthma. The report also shows of those hospitalized, 45% were white, 33% were black. So to put this in context for you, the CDC says African Americans accounted for just 18% of the population of the 14 states that were studied, so they were more impacted overall. Now on the state level here in Georgia, we don't have a clear picture of which groups are most affected. In the majority of the cases here, some 60%, the Department of Public Health says the person's race is unknown. The state told us yesterday that because doctors and labs have not been reporting that information to the state, DPH is now working to circle back, get that data, and make sure it's included going forward. There's been a lot of focus on the numbers, but we don't want to forget about the people behind those facts and numbers. Among those who have died is celebrity hairstylist and makeup artist Charles Gregory, who worked closely with Tyler Perry. And for those of us who've worked in Atlanta, local television for a very long time. We all knew Charles. We'd all worked with him. A very kind man, decent guy, and was so terrific at his craft. Latasha shows us the impact that he leaves behind. If you've ever watched a Tyler Perry movie, read a popular beauty magazine, or attended a fashion event around Atlanta, you've probably already seen the incredible work of Charles Gregory. His death has celebrities from around the country sending their condolences. Today, I spoke with one of his clients and one of his mentees who are just now beginning their grieving process. Whether it's cutting, clipping, or curating a custom hairstyle, celebrity stylist Charles Gregory made an impact, not just on Atlanta, but on the beauty, fashion, and film industry, too. 
Gregory is one of hundreds of Georgians who have died from COVID-19. I got speechless. Not only did I get speechless. Ebony Fashion Fair model Renee Noor says Gregory was a gem to work with. And not only did he open up his arms, he opened up his heart. But one of the things I loved about Charles, he wasn't a person that was selfish. Unconditional love is what he gave to so many of us in the fashion, beauty, film industry. In an Instagram post on March 25th, he announced he had been diagnosed with the coronavirus. He later shared a picture of himself in a hospital gown with a mask and oxygen tubes. But as a young black man in the industry of hair and makeup and film and television production, he just made me know that it's possible. He mentored countless cosmetologists like Cedric Lennard, owner of the East Atlanta Beauty Bar. He inspired me so much as far as, you know, the encouragement and gave me footsteps and just the will and the know, the power, the knowledge, the insight, the knowledge and the power to say you can do. And I believed him. From magazines to movie sets, Gregory graciously shared his talents. Tyler Perry posted on Instagram that he worked with Gregory for years and described him as warm, loving, and hilarious. And Perry's post came just hours after he surprised dozens of shoppers by paying for their groceries at more than 70 stores in Georgia and Louisiana. His post about Gregory shows how the outbreak has impacted him personally. Well, it would be nearly impossible to find someone who hasn't been affected by coronavirus one way or another. So many people are hurting right now from losing loved ones and companies and businesses being forced to reduce hours, delay people off. But Congress is stuck when it comes to giving more money to small businesses, hospitals, or along with states and local governments. Republicans in the Senate wanted to add $250 billion in stimulus money to support the Paycheck Protection Program. Its goal is to support small businesses, but it could run out of money soon since so many businesses say they need help. Democrats have tried to secure more money for hospitals and local governments, but that is also hitting roadblocks. As Congress struggles to come up with a plan, we continue to see record-breaking numbers of people filing for unemployment in Georgia. In one week alone, our state processed more claims than it did in all of last year. One thing is to file a claim. It's another one to actually get that help in hand. So how fast is relief coming? Our Joe Hinkey shares two different women's stories and two very different experiences. It is the tale of two women both filing for unemployment. Julie P. Warren lost her full-time job, immediately filed a claim, and received her first check almost right away. I didn't wait long at all. This, pro this time it actually went smoother. It took six weeks for her to see a check when she lost her job during the Great Recession. Julie is now receiving $275 a week after taxes. Meanwhile, Emily Mooneyhan says she filed for unemployment, received a confirmation letter, but weeks later the grad student and mother has yet to receive a check. Oh. I can look at this letter and see that I am eligible uh, based on income. After Emily filed her claim, the state began requiring some employers to file claims for their employees, and Emily's employer then also submitted a claim. I've been able to get some help from my church, um, financially some help from my family. We called the Georgia Department of Labor today. A spokesperson said Emily's issue is one they are occasionally seeing. Two claims in Emily's name created a log jam and one needed to be cleared out. We are told Emily should now receive her first unemployment check. Julie and Emily are only two stories out of millions nationally. The U.S. Department of Labor reports record numbers of people filed claims in the past three weeks, adding up to 16 million plus claims. The trend is similar here in Georgia. Before the COVID-19 pandemic, around 5,000 people filed new claims each week. The State Department of Labor today announced it processed 390,000 claims last week alone, three times last week's total, and amounting to more claims than in all of 2019. Julie hopes to somehow find work soon as she is one major expense away from being unable to pay her bills. We're able to get my rent paid. I'll be able to keep food on the table, but I don't have any discretionary income to speak of. Well, about a third of renters didn't make their payments this month, according to the National Multifamily Housing Council. An exclusive poll from Survey USA offers insight into how many people are struggling financially during this pandemic. More than half of the people surveyed say they were at least somewhat worried about missing this month's mortgage payment, and 62% of renters said the same. A few people also said they were seeing reduced hours at work, and 18% say they were laid off, while only a small percentage say they had lost their jobs completely. People enrolled in the SNAP food stamp program are finding their options are limited. 
When it comes to getting groceries, the governor has urged people to take advantage of online delivery. But online shopping with curbside pickup or home delivery is not an option yet for people using EBT cards. Or at major chains like Publix and Kroger, a national test program was launched in select states. But Georgia was not one of them. Kroger and Publix say that they are working with state and federal officials to try to get the test program here. But for now, SNAP recipients still have to visit the stores to have the card swiped. We have resources for those now facing unemployment, including a guide for how to file a claim and a list of companies that are hiring right now. You can find those in the As Seen on TV section of the 11 Alive app. Coming up next, a woman and her doctor thought she had COVID-19 after showing all the symptoms, but the test came back negative. We are looking at how often those tests can be wrong. And we are committed to bringing you updates on the coronavirus outbreak all three hours of prime time on air and on our 11 Alive YouTube channel. As always, you can subscribe, get in on the conversation in the community section. There's more 11 Alive news prime time after the break. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during prime time. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. The state has pledged to ramp up testing capacity, especially in Metro Atlanta, which is a hot spot for cases. Right now, the United States is focused on testing the sickest patients, and although the country's top private lab is able to run up to 45,000 tests per day, there are still reports of widespread shortages of swabs, test kits, and protective equipment. So what happens when you're one of those very sick patients who is able to get tested and it comes back negative? That's what happened to a woman in Portland and her experience pushed reporter Maggie Vespa to look into testing accuracy and the likelihood of a false negative result. Our story starts with a phone call from a Portland area woman who had emailed KGW. Hello. She's been sick for more than two weeks. Yeah. March 21st was the first day that I was sick. And she thinks people need to hear this. Oh, because I was really, really frightened that I would wake up in the night and just not be able to breathe. It started with chills and a fever. Just a little over 100. Then came the bad cough with, you guessed it. A very tight feeling in my chest. Eventually, she developed pneumonia. After nearly a week of these symptoms and after a round of tests for other viruses, including the flu, the woman's doctor arranged for her to be tested for COVID-19. Both thought it was an obvious case. Then came the results. That came back negative. Amid a deadly pandemic, it should have been comforting. It wasn't. I was actually um, really scared when it came back negative because I thought, what on earth is wrong with me? The woman in our story still doesn't have a definitive answer, but she says her doctor told her to quarantine herself, isolate, treat her symptoms, basically act like she has COVID-19 because 
Despite that negative test result, her doctor believes she does. And local experts say there's a reason for that. The test is 70% sensitive. If someone has the disease and has the test, 70% of the time the test will be positive and 30% of the time it will be negative. Meaning on average in 30% of COVID-19 cases, the test misses the virus and a person with COVID-19 can't truly know if they have it. Nationally, health experts are sounding the alarm on this. This headline in the New York Times reading, if you have coronavirus symptoms, assume you have the illness, even if you test negative. Same story and same advice from the Oregon Health Authority and the Multnomah County Health Department who say the test is definitely still worthwhile in cases where doctors think it's warranted. So our advice to people is to avoid contact as much as possible with other people, to in fact wear a mask in public, to in fact stay home. The woman who contacted us though worries every time she sees reports that show how many tests come back negative. Her fear? that people will take that number at face value. Each night I would think, how can that many people be having a negative result when I know firsthand it's so hard to get tested? And now it makes more sense to you, maybe. Oh yeah, now it makes a lot more sense to me. LabCorp, the top private lab in the United States, told our sister station that results are based on a lot of factors, like whether the specimen was corrected the right way or packaged and sent properly. And a test result is just one of many factors a doctor should consider when diagnosing a patient. I'm meteorologist Chris Holcomb from the 11 Alive Storm Trackers. We started the day really before sunrise with showers and storms around, and some of that rain may have helped to drop the pollen count a little bit. It was really nice and refreshing out there today with temperatures that were in the 70s. We had windy conditions, though, but you could breathe a little bit better in the air with the pollen count 752. The main pollens present are mulberry, oak, pine, hickory, and sycamore. Grass is in the low range. The weeds aren't really an issue right now as far as the pollen is concerned, and then the mold is also in the high range, so it depends on what your allergen is if you're feeling that. Here's a look at the trends that we've been watching here. Monday, we had about 2,500 pollen count. We got up to 4,300 Tuesday, 3,100 on Wednesday, and then today in the 700. So we're out of the extremely high range, but in the um, high range still. So here's what we're going to be watching. Now, we have cooler air in place. That helps suppress the pollen particles, but then we also have the wind around, and sometimes that can kick up some pollen. So it'll be interesting to see what tomorrow's number is going to be. And you see these winds tonight. These are the wind gusts at 10 o'clock, around 20 miles an hour here in Atlanta. And then by morning, we're going to see those winds that are going to be still gusting in the mid 20s. So even though that wind advisory expired at 8 o'clock, we're still going to have some breezes around. It's just not in those wind advisory criteria. And then during the day on Friday, you can see how the winds die down just a little bit um, for the afternoon hours. Here's a look at the forecast track as we go through the rest of the evening hours tonight. We're going to be falling through the 60s this evening. And then by tomorrow morning, it's going to be on the cool side. We're going to start off with temperatures here in Atlanta around 45 to 47 degrees on the north side, lower 40s and even some 30s in the mountains of North Georgia. Then we will be warming up a little bit during the day with mostly sunny skies, but by lunchtime we'll be at about 50 degrees. And then in the afternoon, we're going to top off only in the 60s, whereas today we are at 78. Tomorrow, yeah, it's going to be cooler in the afternoon, but at least we'll have sunshine. We'll give that a 9 on the wasometer. Now, we're going to be watching storms that are moving in from the west. Saturday, we're going to be dry. It's going to be fine here, but that system you see with severe weather out in parts of Texas is going to be pushing our way during the day on Sunday. Uh, I think we'll be seeing a, a level two risk here in metro Atlanta southward, but then a level three risk possible for those areas in uh, South Georgia and over to South Alabama and Mississippi as well. Here's the European model. Look at that rain coming in on Sunday and then late Sunday overnight into early Monday. That's when we'll see our best chance for some of those stronger storms. 64 for a high Friday, Saturday, mostly sunny, chilly start at 41, then a high of 70. Sunday, the storms move in, ending on Monday, and then we'll see a mixture of sunshine and clouds Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday with those high temperatures in the upper 60s to right around 70 degrees. Chris, thank you. So many businesses are scrambling right now to hold on to their customers, especially restaurants, but one out in Sandy Springs found a clever way to keep that business coming in. As Natisha Lance explains, it all starts with a menu item that's in high demand.
Well, the restaurant got creative to meet customer demand, so they opened up a general store inside the restaurant, and yes, they have toilet paper. Nancy Goodrich knew she had to do something different to keep her Sandy Springs restaurant open. So we decided to open the general store. She announced the decision on Instagram two weeks ago. We have everything really that you need right here. Meats, breads, dairy, dry goods, and some specialty items. We've got plenty of toilet paper and paper towels. At a time when many restaurants are suffering, Southern Bistro is surviving. I don't have to close down, so um, whatever we can do to keep the employees here and pay my vendors, um, you know, that works for me. Before the coronavirus outbreak, Georgia's restaurant industry was on track to make $25 billion this year. We lost an estimated $813 million in sales the first 23 days of March. While takeout service may be working for now, it might not be sustainable long term. Carry out and delivery for a full service restaurant is not enough to hit their break even point. Restaurant chains Panera and Subway are also selling some groceries. Customers can now buy fresh items online and pick up curbside. Without knowing when the virus will pass, restaurants will have to stay nimble. I've been here 15 years and I'm, I'm never going to give up. And customers loyal. You want your favorite restaurant to be around. The time is now to support that favorite restaurant. So the Georgia Association of Restaurants will send out a survey on Friday to check the pulse of the industry again. The last survey they sent out in March showed 12 percent of restaurants were expected to close in 30 days. A lot of people are feeling pressure because of the pandemic and I suppose every time one of us thinks you know we're feeling sorry for ourselves we're sort of brought back to earth by this kind of story, a story of a young couple struggling economically, and yet they are facing a very, very big moment in their lives as their seven-month-old baby is about to undergo heart surgery. But they are right now underemployed, having economic issues, and they are struggling to find a place to be able to stay ahead of the surgery. And this outbreak is costing them so many options. Here's Caitlin Ross with the story for us. They are rambunctious point. They're identical, both uh, blonde hair, blue eyes. Even over a video call, you can see Christopher's eyes light up when he talks about his sons. He says Ashton and Peyton were healthy at birth, but a few months ago, doctors at Children's Healthcare of Atlanta found a problem with Ashton's heart and said they would have to operate as soon as possible. Yes, ma'am, they said that he's a high priority case. His surgery is scheduled for April 22nd, and even with the COVID-19 pandemic, it's not being pushed back. Christopher says his family threw everything in to getting Ashton well. We had to move up here because this is where his cardiologist was. And ever since then, like I said, it's just been a struggle. So we're trying to just find, you know, stable residency, honestly, right now. They were living in hotels for a little while. When money got tight, they found a short-term rental, but say they may have to leave even that. So they found this Airbnb, and uh, now that Governor Kemp's doing all this about the Airbnbs, you know, they're not wanting to rent to us. He says all of the uncertainty is just adding to the stress of the regulations already placed on Ashton's surgery because of the pandemic. On his pre-op day, which is 21st, my wife is the only one that can go up there with him. And then after his surgery, for two days, we're not allowed to see him at all. They started an online fundraiser to offset the cost of finding housing close to Ashton's doctors during the pandemic. More than anything, they just want him healed. You don't ever want to hear that your child's sick, but I know that I can't do nothing about it. Help them out. It's just, that's what bothers me the most. We put a link to their fundraiser on our website, 11alive.com, in the As Seen on TV section. She was only 13, but a pioneer. She helped advocate for the people, in the people that were struggling with epilepsy and other illnesses. Next, we'll explain why her legacy will live on. Live today. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only.
We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Her health battle helped to lead the push to legally allow medicinal marijuana to be used to treat certain illnesses. Well, tonight we are sad to share that 13 year old Charlotte Figgy has died. Charlotte suffered from a rare form of epilepsy, causing her to have several seizures a day. Her mom discovered a CBD oil that helped and advocated for states to allow it to be used. We interviewed her back in 2014 when she spoke with Georgia lawmakers about her daughter and went from uh, how she went from 1200 seizures a month to just one or two while taking that product. Georgia later passed a law allowing medicinal marijuana for certain illnesses. Charlotte was recently hospitalized in Colorado after she and her entire family got sick. She tested negative for COVID-19, but because her symptoms were so similar, she was treated as if she had the virus. She passed away on Tuesday. Her cause of death is still under review. Still ahead for you tonight, as the coronavirus spreads, doctors are now urging people who recovered to donate blood. Why this could be the key to saving a life. To the Verify team, is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today.
In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email. Scientists are looking for people who have recovered from COVID-19 and the antibodies in their blood can help develop vaccines. After our friend uh, 11 Alive, Sandy Parati became ill, he recovered subsequently, and now he is donating blood in an effort to try to help others. He walks us through the process. Okay, you okay? Yeah. It's 16 days after I first experienced COVID-19 symptoms, and my doctor, Nicholas Boyu, believes I fully recovered. He runs the Highland Urgent Care in Atlanta. So we're gonna prove that we, you no longer harbor this because you'll have immunity, and then you'll know. Okay. To make sure he gives me another test. Okay, keep your head back. This is the fun part, right? Inserting a six inch long Q-tip up my nasal <laughs> cavity in search of a sample. Okay. There's gray matter on the end of that. That's what we're looking for. Oh man, it's like tickling your brain. The results should come back in a few days. I fully expect you to be negative your two weeks out. And like I said, you are a valuable commodity now. A valuable commodity because Dr. Bayou says the antibodies in my blood could hold the key to a potential vaccine, a new test, or treatment for the coronavirus. The fact that you've recovered from the illness and are no longer febrile means you, your body had gained the upper hand. The only way it would have done that would have been on a healthy immune response where you develop antibodies against it. Dr. Bayou then draws my blood. Okay. He'll submit a sample to a private lab, which will then use my plasma to identify the antibodies. A tube right here um, is going to have antibodies against COVID. One of the most valuable things on the planet right now. Using antibodies is not new. It's an age-old treatment used for decades to develop therapies which have been used to fight diseases like Ebola. So if the virus looks like this, your body is going to build an antibody against it. If it looks like that, like a lock and key. Mm -hmm. and now it's identified this as a foreign particle. Other elements of the immune system will come in to destroy the virus. Because we want the structure of that antibody because we cannot produce anything nearly as well as your body can that can fight this virus as that antibody. This past Monday, my test results returned and showed no signs of the virus. The American Red Cross is in the process of establishing a program to allow recovered patients to donate their plasma. If you're interested in donating, you can sign up using a link posted in this story on 11alive.com. As we learn new things about this virus, the CDC and other health officials continue to update guidance about how to protect yourself and stop the spreading of the disease from others and to other people. Now, from studying cases in China, we know a lot about the timeline of symptoms and hospitalization. Data from one study shows that from the time symptoms begin to about a week after, the person will experience mild symptoms. For those whose symptoms get worse, day seven or eight is when they start experiencing shortness of breath and will be admitted to the hospital. Around day 10 or 11 is when people with severe symptoms will be admitted to the ICU and according to one cardiologist, they can stay there for up to two weeks. Now all of this new information can help us make sense of why the CDC continues to update guidelines. But a big change was when U.S. health officials told people they should start covering their face in public. Let's take a look now at the timeline and why that recommendation actually changed. This is U.S. health officials advising against the general public wearing masks in early March. Should you wear a mask if you're healthy? No. There is no advantage to you wearing or buying a mask. Now states and the federal government are changing their tune on who should wear a mask. Wearing cloth face coverings in public settings where other social distancing measures are difficult to maintain. So what's the deal with masks? 
To start, let's take a look at the CDC's initial guidelines on masks. It says the CDC does not recommend healthy people to wear a face mask. It should only be used by people who have COVID-19 and are showing symptoms. That sounds pretty straightforward, right? But how do you know if you are healthy? Well, from early on during the outbreak, we knew that some people who are infected with the virus may not show symptoms for up to 14 days. This is called the incubation period, and it's possible for someone to spread the virus even when they don't have symptoms. But we didn't quite know to what degree this occurs and how much it drives the outbreak. That's where countries diverged on their guidance on masks. U.S. health officials believe that asymptomatic spreading, which we've seen some evidence of, but not the major driver. You really need to just focus on the individuals that are symptomatic. Adding on top of that was the pragmatic concern that a run on masks could worsen the already severe shortage of medical supplies for hospitals and the fear that masks may give people a false sense of security. So the CDC decided not to embrace the mass public use of face masks. Meanwhile, the same evidence led health officials in Asia to a different conclusion. Countries started advising or even mandating that healthy people wear masks in crowded places, citing fear of asymptomatic transmission. As expected, the demand for masks in those places skyrocketed, causing an immediate shortage, which was eased by government intervention. And then... Now 80 cases in the U.S. 3,000. 16,000. More than 160,000 cases in the United States. More coronavirus cases than any country in the world. As the outbreak accelerated in the U.S., new cases of asymptomatic transmission challenged the reassuring message by health officials about the way the coronavirus spreads. COVID-19, it's being spread by these silent spreaders. How can you tell people to only wear a mask if they're sick, if they don't know if they're sick? Evidence grew stronger suggesting asymptomatic transmission may be responsible for more cases than previously thought, eventually prompting the CDC to adopt new thinking about the benefits of masks. With the new data that there's significant asymptomatic transmission, this is being critically re-reviewed. One reason why some Asian countries have promoted the idea that the general public should wear masks from the beginning is likely because of their experience with SARS, a 2003 epidemic of a virus similar to the coronavirus and that spread mostly in Asia. One study found that always wearing a mask when going out was associated with a 70% reduction in risk. SARS also fundamentally changed how people in Asia view masks, removing the stigma of wearing masks in public. But the mask debate comes with two big caveats. First, there is still a dire shortage of personal protective equipment in hospitals across the country, putting medical workers at increased risk of contracting the virus. They're having us use the same mask between patients and using single-use masks up to five times or more. We desperately need to address that to give our frontline healthcare workers the best protection they deserve. And second, masks are not magic shields, and they cannot replace social distancing. Countries like South Korea that successfully flattened the curve did so by combining mask wearing with mass testing, social distancing, and rigorous contact tracing. Only by using a combination of methods and by working together can we effectively stop the spread of the coronavirus. Tonight, a story of hope. Nearly a year after an automobile crash, a devastating one, a teen reached some major milestones in his history trying to recover. His friends wanted to celebrate his birthday, but Matt Pearl found out they had to get real creative in this time of COVID-19. Everything that used to be so easy is no longer. Here is where it starts. 18-year-old Holden Ludwig. Five days after graduating high school. One day after he was T-boned in his car and critically injured. You feel like you're in a dream. It's a lonely world when you're, you're healing like this. Um, for so long. Recovery takes community. Neighbors hung blue ribbons. His school held a candlelight vigil. Holden knew none of this. Doctors said he had suffered the worst kind of traumatic brain injury. His victories, months later, were a raised arm, a held hat. Recognition of what an object is. Nice job, Holden. All these little victories that seem so silly, like putting a hat on, are huge. By early October, Holden was talking. I'm lucky. You're very lucky. By early November, he was walking with plenty of help. You just got to look at the positive side of literally even like the worst moment. His community behind him, Holden made progress at facilities across Atlanta until the COVID-19 outbreak forced him to stay home. We feel that loss right now, especially because they say um, that build up to the year is the most important part for brain injury recovery. It's a tenuous time, but last week brought Holden's birthday, and he showed right away 
he won't slow down. That was so relieving. Good job. It made me feel more, way more functional than I have been. I'm looking pretty too. You look beautiful. And then all of a sudden, this, you know, train of cars. <laughs> Holden's community came through with a drive through celebration. They all like drove by with their, their cool cars. It made me super happy and excited. I'll tell you that. We're not getting through this without a fight. Waiting to see how far Holden goes. And, and I don't, I don't honestly think he's done. The coronavirus is forcing millions of people to stay home and it is leading to a disturbing trend. What is being done to help victims? That's coming up next. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 1105 News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. We have been told by one area Atlanta hospital that they are seeing a 15% increase in domestic violence cases at their facilities. That was Georgia Governor Brian Kemp at a recent news conference saying while Georgia deals with the COVID-19 pandemic, a local hospital is seeing an increase in domestic violence cases. The governor's statement comes as a shock to even advocates who work to help domestic violence survivors. Reveal investigator Faith Abube explains. Sheltered in place. He also choked her. Who was trying to fight her? More, more fit, in close quarters with their abusers. Did he hit you? They were elder just in the mouth. And frustrations running high. She's aggressive, wanting to fight. These are just a few of the Metro Atlanta domestic violence calls to 911 
in the last few days. He wants to kill the lady. Is the husband his wife? I need somebody right away. Advocates say while Georgia is under a stay-at-home order, the risk for domestic violence is as real as it's ever been, if not more. It really does complicate things. Jan Christensen is the executive director of the Georgia Coalition Against Domestic Violence. It's not easy for people who live with somebody who can be potentially violent uh, to to have to stay in close quarters with them all the time and not be able to get out. Christensen's group is the umbrella agency for all domestic violence programs in the state of Georgia. Statewide, they expect Georgia's domestic violence problem to get worse during the COVID-19 pandemic. But she says they weren't expecting this. We have been told by one area, Atlanta Hospital, that they are seeing a 15% increase in domestic violence cases at their facilities. In some ways, I'm almost surprised that a, a local hospital has seen a 15% increase in um, domestic violence cases only because um, I think that people are, survivors are going to find it harder to reach out and get help. In emails to 11 Alive, Governor Brian Kemp's office said in part, we're not going to get into additional specifics about the 15% increase the governor referenced. We went directly to area hospitals, law enforcement agencies, and advocates to find out what they're seeing. Atlanta's Grady Hospital, the largest hospital in the state of Georgia, told us we do not keep stats on domestic violence cases. Wellstar said, in light of the COVID-19 pandemic, we're not able to provide the information because it would need more research. The GBI said it doesn't keep that data. And Christensen says the state's domestic violence hotline hasn't even finished calculating its March data yet. Statistics tell us that when there is a national emergency or a local emergency, that um, calls for help like this may go down initially, only because people are trying to figure out how to navigate in the space with which they can. Regardless, Christensen believes the risk to domestic violence survivors is undeniable. I think that 15% could really be representative of a lot more that's going on out there. The condition might not be ideal, but Christensen wants victims to remember, even under a shelter-in-place order, help for domestic violence survivors is still only a call away. Even if somebody can't leave or isn't ready to leave or is afraid to leave, that there is gonna be an advocate on the other end of the, of the phone uh, when you call that number. The Georgia Domestic Violence Number Hotline is 1-800-334-2836. We were able to get some information from the Atlanta Police Department, the Criminal Justice Coordinating Council, and the hotline for the past year. You can find it all right now on this story in 11alive.com. I'm meteorologist Chris Holcomb from the 11 Alive Storm Trackers, where after that stormy start this morning, we have been dealing with a really nice day, despite the fact that we had a lot of wind around. But the sunshine helped those temperatures rebound today. We got up to 78 degrees for our high temperature this afternoon. Our low this morning was 62. That was on the mild side. So you can see the low this morning was actually above average, but our high this afternoon was above the average. Now we picked up only 19 hundredths of an inch of rain during the overnight hours. I know a lot of other people picked up more than that with some of those showers that moved through, but they were fast movers, so they didn't linger that much. Our rainfall surplus right now is about 11 and a half inches above where we should be in rainfall for the year. You can see those temperatures, how we're gonna be falling uh, through the 60s for the rest of the evening hours, and then 50s after midnight, and then by tomorrow morning, even starting off in the 40s with uh, some sunshine and clouds that'll be mixing in at times. So it's gonna be a, a below average start to the day here tomorrow. And then during the day, you can see some sunshine mixing in at times with just a few clouds. And then we warm into those lower 60s for high temperatures. I think we'll be about 62 to 64 degrees. And then it's gonna be even cooler going into Friday night and Saturday morning. We're talking about waking up Saturday morning to temperatures that'll be in the lower 40s. That means 30s in the outlying areas. But for tomorrow, a nine on the wasometer, high temperatures up to around 64 degrees, mostly sunny skies, but temperatures are cooler than average. Now, our focus as we head into the weekend is gonna be watching the storm system that's developing out to the west. We're gonna be fine on Saturday. It's gonna be a chilly start. We get up back to around 70 degrees Saturday afternoon with mostly sunny skies. But that system that you see back in Texas causing the potential for severe weather is gonna be moving our way on Sunday. And we are watching for the potential for a severe weather outbreak 
over parts of the southeast. I really think that the strongest storms are going to be in that orange color that you see there from Louisiana to central and southern Mississippi, uh, central and southern Alabama, and parts of central and southwestern Georgia. I do think Atlanta, though, will most likely be in the uh, level two of five risk for severe storms. So I just want you to be prepared on Sunday. Keep an eye to the weather. I know it's Easter Sunday. Most, play, most folks are sheltering in place, though, so keep an eye on those storms, though, that are going to be coming in uh, on Sunday. Some of those could turn severe. As you can see on Saturday, we're going to have uh, a mixture of sunshine and clouds, and then here comes that rain on Sunday looking pretty soggy, but really the best chance for the storms looks like that'll be late Sunday into early on Monday before everything clears out. Here's that seven-day forecast. You see the cooler air Friday, Saturday morning, down to 41 in the city, and then we're up to 70. Here comes the rain on Sunday with the storms. The uh, strongest storms look like they'll be late Sunday into early Monday before it clears out. Then a mixture of sunshine and clouds Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday with high temperatures in the upper 60s to right around 70 as we go through the first part of next week. Here are three stories you may have missed today. Georgia is pushing back its primary election. Last month, Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger delayed the presidential primary until May 19th, combining it with a regularly scheduled general primary. But now the election is moving to June 9th. The decision comes less than 24 hours after Governor Kemp extended the current public health state emergency, and that runs through May 13th. After a coronavirus-induced hiatus, Saturday Night Live will air new content this week. The show will air remotely produced content in its usual Saturday time slot. However, it is not clear if the performances will be live or not. The CDC has loosened the rules to allow essential employees who have been exposed to the coronavirus to return to work. Under the new guidelines, people can only go back to work if they are experiencing no symptoms. They should also take their temperature before shifts, practice social distancing and wear face masks. Previously exposed workers were told to stay at home for 14 days. So to come, an incredible story of perseverance. How an Atlanta native went from being hospitalized to making a full recovery from COVID-19. Truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Well, 
although thousands of people are, are being diagnosed with COVID-19, thousands also are recovering. This is the story of one Atlanta native by the name of Billy Roberts, who's out in California. And Roberts contracted the virus, and though it was a very, very tough battle for him, he has fully recovered. Our sister station in Sacramento has that story. My symptoms really lasted like 27 days. It was, it was a tough, tough fight. Billy sharing his story to help others. I was uh, at a practice football game, a flag football, and we, um, I just got really winded. And then I, the next day I got just a really high fever. So I went to the doctor and, um, and I, was having her, I was having a hard time breathing. They gave me their last test. They went through the 25 and they, um, they gave me their last one. The results did not come back for another five days. Things took a turn for the worst. Billy had to go to the hospital. And I called my doctor because I was just, I just took my dog out and I literally couldn't get up the steps without, um, it felt like when you, you breathe out okay, but when you breathe in, it felt like you were just trying to like pull up a 10 weight anchor and um, I'll get really dizzy and my fever was at 103. Billy's situation was complicated by his asthma. So day 10, I felt, I felt like I was getting better. I was like, thank God it's over. Like you do, you know, when you have a flu. And then for some reason, day 11, um, it's like my, my immune system attacked itself. It was like overcompensating. And, and that's when I just crashed. And I think that's what the danger is. Thankfully, Billy recovered. And he has advice based on his experience. I would say um, to get one of these things that measures your oxygen, you can get them at CVS. And if your oxygen gets below 90, I would say immediately go to the hospital. He worries about asymptomatic spread. I came into contact with, you know, the gym. And that's the thing, like, you don't, you're not exhibiting symptoms, so you're exposing a lot of people. And I didn't know I had it until, you know, until I was too late and I was showing a fever and I was showing the signs. I think we all have to assume we have it because this virus is, is different. You know, you're, you're giving it to other people when you have no symptoms. And then when you have symptoms, it's kind of too late. Still to come on Prime Time, what does it take to staff our hospitals right now? Meet some of the people rising to the challenge on the front lines. That's coming up next. Uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, 
live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. We talk a lot about the impact the coronavirus pandemic is having on our economy, how it's hurting so many Georgia families and small businesses, but it's also leaving its mark on some places you might not expect. Like Zoo Atlanta, while the gates may be closed, there are still more than 1,000 animals to care for, and that requires people. But 90% of the zoo's budget comes from attendance fees and other activities, according to our partners at the Atlanta Business Chronicle. With Zoo Atlanta completely closed for at least three months, President and CEO Raymond King estimates they could lose up to $7.6 million this spring. In order to counteract those losses, they are taking drastic measures. Half of Zoo Atlanta's 186 full-time staffers have been laid off or furloughed. All 73 seasonal employees have lost their jobs. The remaining workers, including 85 animal caretakers, have taken pay cuts of 5 to 15 percent. King has suspended his own salary and other executives have taken 25 percent pay cuts. Those cuts have helped reduce Zoo Atlanta's losses to just under three and a half million dollars. They're hoping that they can make up that amount through an emergency fundraising campaign. If you'd like to help, it runs through May 5th. 11 Alive News Primetime on the ATL starts now. Tonight, a closer look at the rising number of COVID-19 cases in Georgia and how our state got here. Plus, one in 10 Americans filing for unemployment, but how fast is relief coming? Two local women share their different experiences. Good evening, I'm Aisha Howard. Out of 14 states study, Georgia was sixth in line when it came to the number of confirmed cases based on limited testing. The numbers on age line up with what health officials have been telling us all along, that older people and those with health conditions are most at risk, but younger people are getting sick too. 90% of those admitted to the hospital had underlying health conditions, but there are some common conditions for Americans. We're talking about high blood pressure and obesity. Many also had metabolic diseases like diabetes or chronic lung disease like asthma. The report also shows of those hospitalized, 45% were white, 33% were black. To put this into context, the CDC says blacks accounted for just 18% of the population of the 14 states study, so they are more impacted overall. At the state level, we still don't have a clear picture of which groups are most affected. In the majority of the cases in Georgia, some 60% of the Department of Public Health says the person's race is unknown. The state told us yesterday that's because doctors and labs have not been reporting that information to the state. DPH is now working to circle back to get that data and make sure it is included from here on. We all follow the numbers, but these are people who deserve to be remembered and honored. Their friends and loved ones going through a lot. 11 Alive, Latasha Given shares one of their stories. This time last year, our family was planning and preparing to throw her a surprise 80th birthday party. Ebony Rogers is talking about her grandmother, Alfreda Golden from Savannah, Georgia, who helped raise her. She shared these pictures from the 80th birthday party. Loved ones traveled long distances just to be able to shower her with love. At her party, people were able to share story after story after story about the significant ways that she had generously poured out her love on them. Fast forward one year, now they're mourning her death. My grandmother passed away last Thursday, April 2nd, due to complications with COVID-19. Just weeks shy of what would have been her 81st birthday. Golden is one of hundreds of Georgia lives claimed by the coronavirus pandemic. She loved to cook and bake. Her family says she made the best lemon pound cake, hands down. The former educator leaves behind 13 grandchildren and 22 great grandchildren, all of whom say she bestowed upon them everlasting life lessons. And the one that resonates the most with my heart right now is to not just tell people that you love them, but to show them. I would want the world to know that my grandmother was a remarkable woman, and I know that I will spend the rest of my life doing my absolute best to honor her legacy. And because of the shelter in place orders in several states and travel restrictions, the family was not able to have a formal funeral. They plan to hold a memorial service later in the year. 
Well, between the number of COVID cases filling our hospitals and the labor intensive, highly specialized care needed once they arrive, medical professionals are in high demand. Reveal investigator Rebecca Lindstrom looks at who is answering that call. And you have to be able to move fast. Gary Nestrick has worked 30 years as a nurse, much of it in emergency rooms and intensive care units at Emory. Sure, you don't have time to, to ask 50 questions. He retired from the ICU in 2018, taking a slower paced role at a new hospital just two days a week. I thought that's what you do when you when you're toning down your career. You just kind of coast into you know the sunset. Then came COVID-19 and Nestrick says he didn't think twice. It's not right for me to, to take what I know and just sit on the sidelines. Countless medical professionals have shifted roles and added hours to help as patients pour into hospitals. To isolate, quarantine, or shelter in place. Since mid-March, the Georgia Board of Nursing has issued 926 new nursing licenses. The Georgia Medical Composite Board, which licenses doctors, says both groups have also been hit with a wave of applications for temporary permits. So far, they have issued 385 short-term permits for medical professionals from other states. All about 25% come from Florida. Permits have been issued for doctors from as far away as Arizona, Washington, and California. The bulk specializing in family practice or women's health. If some of these folks are coming in the backfill, other folks are going directly to the front line. So as you can imagine, it's a gigantic chess match. Bill Ryan is leading Piedmont Healthcare's recruitment effort. Piedmont is a great place to work. He's using Facebook, Twitter, text and email campaigns, even Instagram. The message, come help fight the virus. And what's the response been like? It's been overwhelming. They know what they're getting themselves into and they still step up in order to help. Graduated medical students, nursing medical students, nurses in academia, LPNs, nurses in the military medical corps, along with retired nurses. Nestrick says with so many having limited ICU experience, it was important for him to come back. Last week, he started briefing a nurse to take over his patients. And I got to talking about the ventilator and she just said, stop. I've never taken care of a patient on a ventilator. Ever. The work is exhausting and for many emotional. There was a, a patient who died and the nurse held up a phone to his ear so his wife could talk to him. But it can also be rewarding, especially for those that have experience to offer. It kind of made you feel good that, you know, you're old and not obsolete. Many healthcare workers continue to show up for work, even though they know it could be putting their own families at risk. Well, now Hilton Hotels and American Express are teaming up with eight other companies to ease those worries. Starting Monday, they're providing help to a million free hotel rooms to critical care medical personnel all across the country. The offer is good through May 31st. They're using medical associations to book the rooms. The goal to give those workers a place to recharge, rest and isolate themselves from their families to prevent spreading the virus. Hilton expects to have a list of its properties in Georgia and Metro Atlanta taking part in the program by this weekend. We'll be sure to post that on 11alive.com when we receive it. Well, it would be nearly impossible to find someone who hasn't been affected by coronavirus one way or another. So many people hurting right now with companies and businesses forced to reduce hours or lay people off. But Congress is stuck when it comes to giving more money to small businesses, hospitals, along with state and local governments. Republicans in the Senate wanted to add $250 billion in stimulus money to support the Paycheck Protection Program. Its goal is to support small businesses, but it could run out of money soon since so many businesses say they need help. Democrats have tried to secure some more money for hospitals and local governments, but that's also hitting some roadblocks. The phone doesn't stop ringing at the Georgia Department of Labor. The number of unemployment claims it processed last week alone is more than it processed all of 2019. If you're trying to file, Joe Henke shares some tips from the state labor commissioner. The Georgia Department of Labor is processing claims at a record pace. Last week alone, more than 390,000 claims processed, amounting to more claims than in all of 2019, and totaling $42 million in unemployment payments in one week. 
All of the claims leading to more work than ever for the State Department of Labor, which Labor Commissioner Mark Butler says employed 2,200 people during the Great Recession. Uh, right now, statewide, we have about 1,000 employees. Uh, not all of those are UI specialists, uh, and we're getting anywhere from 60 to 80,000 phone calls a day. Imagine this, you're a worker that shows up for work at 8 o'clock in the morning, and you've got over 250 voicemails, uh, 10,000 emails in your, in your inbox, and the phone's already ringing. That's what our employees are experiencing around the state right now. Butler says people should only contact his office if they have a serious problem with an unemployment claim, such as it being denied. They are trying to cover as many other issues and questions and information published to the Department of Labor's website and social media channels. On Monday, Butler says more people will be able to file claims, including self-employed individuals and independent contractors, thanks to the federal coronavirus stimulus law known as the CARES Act. So Monday the 13th, uh, you will be able to uh, go in and file your claim and there'll be some additional questions. Anyone in this category that already filed will be contacted, Butler said. He stressed they should not file a new claim. Also beginning on Monday, Butler says people who have or are filing for unemployment will qualify to receive $600 in additional unemployment benefits also from the CARES Act. A department spokeswoman says that those payments will be backdated to April 4th. Restaurants are scrambling to hold on to customers. One Sandy Springs restaurant found a clever way to keep business coming in. Natisha Lance explains it all starts with a menu item that is in high demand. Well, the restaurant got creative to meet customer demand, so they opened up a general store inside the restaurant. And yes, they have toilet paper. Nancy Goodrich knew she had to do something different to keep her Sandy Springs restaurant open. So we decided to open the general store. She announced the decision on Instagram two weeks ago. We have everything really that you need right here. Meats, breads, dairy, dry goods, and some specialty items. We've got plenty of toilet paper and paper towels. At a time when many restaurants are suffering, Southern Bistro is surviving. I don't have to close down, so um, whatever we can do to keep the employees here and pay my vendors, um, you know, that works for me. Before the coronavirus outbreak, Georgia's restaurant industry was on track to make $25 billion this year. We lost an estimated $813 million in sales the first 23 days of March. While takeout service may be working for now, it might not be sustainable long term. Carry out and delivery for a full service restaurant is not enough to hit their break even point. Restaurant chains Panera and Subway are also selling some groceries. Customers can now buy fresh items online and pick up curbside. Without knowing when the virus will pass, restaurants will have to stay nimble. I've been here 15 years and I'm, I'm never going to give up. And customers loyal. You want your favorite restaurant to be around. The time is now to support that favorite restaurant. So the Georgia Association of Restaurants will send out a survey on Friday to check the pulse of the industry again. The last survey they sent out in March showed 12 percent of restaurants were expected to close in 30 days. Next, a woman and her doctor thought she had COVID-19 after showing all the symptoms, but the test came back negative. We're looking at how often those tests get it wrong. You felt that uh, wind coming in today. That's bringing in some cooler air and there's more cool air on the way. Stay with us. We'll let you know what happens when that clashes with a frontal boundary moving in as we head into the weekend and the potential for severe storms. Stay with us. We are giving you updates on the coronavirus outbreak all three hours of prime time on air and on the 11 Alive YouTube channel. Subscribe and join the conversation down in the community section. We've got more 11 Alive news in prime time after the break. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today.
let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 1101 Live News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11. The state has pledged to ramp up testing capacity, especially in Metro Atlanta, which is a hot spot for cases. Right now, the United States is focusing on testing the sickest patients. And although the country's top private lab is able to run up to 45,000 tests per day, there are still reports out there of widespread shortages of swabs, test kits and protective equipment. So what happens when you are one of those very sick patients who is able to get tested and it comes back negative. It happened to a woman in Portland. Her experience pushed reporter Maggie Vespa to look into testing accuracy and the likelihood of a false negative result. Our story starts with a phone call from a Portland area woman who had emailed KGW. Hello. She's been sick for more than two weeks. Yeah. March 21st was the first day that I was sick. And she thinks people need to hear this. Because I was really, really frightened that I would wake up in the night and just not be able to breathe. It started with chills and a fever. Just a little over 100. Then came the bad cough with, you guessed it. A very tight feeling in my chest. Eventually, she developed pneumonia. After nearly a week of these symptoms and after a round of tests for other viruses, including the flu, the woman's doctor arranged for her to be tested for COVID-19. Both thought it was an obvious case. Then came the results. That came back negative. Amid a deadly pandemic, it should have been comforting. It wasn't. I was actually um, really scared when it came back negative because I thought, what on earth is wrong with me? The woman in our story still doesn't have a definitive answer, but she says her doctor told her to quarantine herself, isolate, treat her symptoms, basically act like she has COVID-19 because despite that negative test result, her doctor believes she does. And local experts say there's a reason for that. The test is 70% sensitive. If someone has the disease and has the test, 70% of the time the test will be positive and 30% of the time it will be negative. Meaning on average in 30% of COVID-19 cases, the test misses the virus and a person with COVID-19 can't truly know if they have it. Nationally, health experts are sounding the alarm on this. This headline in the New York Times reading, if you have coronavirus symptoms, assume you have the illness, even if you test negative. Same story and same advice from the Oregon Health Authority and the Multnomah County Health Department who say the test is definitely still worthwhile in cases where doctors think it's warranted. So our advice to people is to avoid contact as much as possible with other people, to in fact wear a mask in public, to in fact stay home. The woman who contacted us though worries every time she sees reports that show how many tests come back negative. Her fear? that people will take that number at face value. Each night I would think, how can that many people be having a negative result when I know firsthand it's so hard to get tested? <clears throat> and now it makes more sense to you, maybe. Oh yeah, now it makes a lot more sense to me. LabCorp, the top private lab in the U.S., told our sister station that results are based on a lot of factors like whether the specimen was collected the right way or packaged and sent properly. And the test result is just one of many factors a doctor should consider when diagnosing a patient. <coughs> I'm meteorologist Chris Holcomb from the 11 Alive Storm Trackers with you live now on TV as well as on Facebook. We've got about 250 people on right now. We had a little bit over 300 just a few minutes ago, uh, and now we're down to around 250. So a lot of folks on here uh, asking about specific uh, forecasting information for their area. Also, a lot of people are wanting to know 
What about this Sunday storm risk? So I'm going to break that down for you coming up. I'd love for you to be a part of this conversation. If you want to join us, just go to my Facebook page, Chris Holcomb 11 Alive, and you'll see that Facebook Live right there. And I'm going to be getting to a lot of their comments and questions once I finish what we're talking about here. I don't know if you've been outside tonight. It feels pretty good. Today, we got up to 78 degrees for a high temperature this afternoon. During the evening, it has been cooling down. Right now, we're 68 here in Atlanta. We have mid-60s up in Canton, lower 60s in Blair. 50s in Clayton, and on the south side, generally temperatures that are in the 60s. Eatonton is still showing off right there at 70 degrees with some comfortable temperatures. But I want you to see and watch what's going to be happening as we go through the evening hours tonight. These temperatures tonight will continue to drop. This is at 10. We'll be in the mid-60s there, 50s up in far north Georgia. Then by tomorrow morning, look at the blue colors coming in. Yeah, it's going to be on the cool side in the morning. We're going to drop down into the mid and upper 40s. I'm going with 47 here in Atlanta. This model say in 46 on the north side, some low to mid 40s. And look at Blairsville and Clayton in the morning. Temperatures there in the 30s. So it's going to be really chilly there. And on the south side, some 40s and even some 50s around. So it'll be moving up once we get to lunchtime tomorrow, right around 51 degrees. And then we will get into the low 60s tomorrow, which is going to be below average compared to today's temperature that was in the upper 70s. So I'm going with 64 for a high after a morning low of 47. We'll see mostly sunny skies. It's still going to be a little bit breezy. And we're going to go with a nine on the wasometer. Something else we were just talking about on Facebook Live. There's a red flag warning in effect for tomorrow. That's because of the very dry air in place and low relative humidity mixing with the wind. It'll be easy to, for fires to not only start, but for also to spread. So don't be starting any fires or anything tomorrow. So uh, Friday and Saturday are going to be dry days. No weather features showing up on the map. But I want to take you into the weekend. And even though we're going to be fine here in Atlanta on Saturday, we're going to be watching storms out to the west in parts of Texas. Uh, that are going to be getting their act together and moving toward us. And unfortunately, this is going to time out to be here on Easter Sunday. And right now, the severe weather risk, it looks like we'll be at a level two out of five risk around Atlanta and southward. And then the level three of five risk for parts of Louisiana, also into uh, Mississippi and Alabama and areas just to the south of us. Now, we're going to be watching this very closely over the next few days when some more high resolution models start coming in. We'll be able to pinpoint those impacts and the timing a little bit better. For now, here's what we have Sunday. Uh, Saturday night late, we're going to be dry, but then look at this rain coming in on Sunday and then even uh, late Sunday night into early Monday. That's when we have that potential for some storms. And again, we'll be fine tuning that over the next few days, but uh, just keep an eye on those showers and storms as they continue to move through our area. And we could see some damaging winds in association with that. I'm trying to advance to the seven day forecast. Of course, it's not going to that. So let me get to it. There we go. Uh, where we're going to see 70 for a high Saturday after that chilly morning. Storms Sunday into early on Monday and then clearing out, drying out Monday, Tuesday and Wednesday. Mix of sun and clouds with highs in the upper 60s to even the lower 70s once we get into the middle of next week. A lot of people are feeling extra stress because of the pandemic. Now imagine you're a parent of a seven month old baby about to undergo heart surgery. The parents reached out to us struggling to find a place to stay ahead of the surgery. The outbreak costing them opportunities to work and limiting other options. Caitlin Ross shares their story. They are rambunctious point. They're identical, both uh, blonde hair, blue eyes. Even over a video call, you can see Christopher's eyes light up when he talks about his sons. He says Ashton and Peyton were healthy at birth, but a few months ago, doctors at Children's Healthcare of Atlanta found a problem with Ashton's heart and said they would have to operate as soon as possible. Yes, ma'am, they said that he's a high priority case. His surgery is scheduled for April 22nd, and even with the COVID-19 pandemic, it's not being pushed back. Christopher says his family threw everything in to getting Ashton well. We had to move up here because this is where his cardiologist was. And ever since then, like I said, it's just been a struggle, so we're trying to just find you know, stable residency, honestly, right now. They were living in hotels for a little while. When money got tight, they found a short-term rental, but say they may have to leave even that. So they found this Airbnb, and uh, now that Governor Kemp's doing all this about the Airbnbs, you know, they're not wanting to rent to us. He says all of the uncertainty is just adding to the stress of the regulations already placed on Ashton's surgery because of the pandemic. On his pre-op day, which is 21st, my wife is the only one that can go up there with him. And then after his surgery, 
for two days, we're not allowed to see him at all. They started an online fundraiser to offset the cost of finding housing close to Ashton's doctors during the pandemic. More than anything, they just want him healed. You don't ever want to hear that your child's sick, but I know that I can't do nothing about it. Help him out. It's just, that's what bothers me most. We put a link to their fundraiser on our website, 11alive.com, in the As Seen on TV section. She was only 13 years old, but truly a pioneer. She helped advocate for treatment for people struggling with epilepsy and other illnesses. Next, we explain why her legacy will live on. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Her health battle helped lead the push to legally allow medicinal marijuana to be used to treat certain illnesses. Tonight, we are sad to share that 13 year old Charlotte Fiji has died. Charlotte suffered from a rare form of epilepsy, causing her to have several seizures a day. Her mom discovered a CBD oil that helped and advocated for states to allow it to be used. We interviewed her in 2014 when she spoke to Georgia lawmakers about how her daughter went from 1200 seizures a month to just one or two while taking CBD. Georgia later passed a law allowing medicinal marijuana for certain illnesses. Charlotte was recently hospitalized in Colorado after she and her entire family got sick. She tested negative for COVID-19, but because the symptoms were so similar, she was treated as if she had the virus. She passed away Tuesday. Her cause of death is still under review. Still to come tonight as the coronavirus spreads, doctors are now urging people who recovered to donate blood why this could be the key to saving a life. And here from the Atlanta native who went from being hospitalized to making a full recovery from COVID-19. You and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only.
We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during prime time. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage. Scientists are looking for people who have recovered from COVID-19. The antibodies in their blood can help develop vaccines, testing, and treatment. After he got sick with COVID-19, Reveal investigator Andy Parati donated his blood. He walks us through the process. Okay. It's 16 days after I first experienced COVID-19 symptoms and my doctor, Nicholas Boyu, believes I fully recovered. He runs the Highland Urgent Care in Atlanta. So we're gonna prove that you no longer harbor this because you'll have immunity and then you'll know. Okay. To make sure he gives me another test. Okay, keep your head back. This is the fun part, right? inserting a six inch long Q-tip of my nasal cavity in search of a sample. Okay. There's gray matter on the end of that. That's what we're looking for. Oh man, it's like tickling your brain. The results should come back in a few days. I fully expect you to be negative your two weeks out. And like I said, you are a valuable commodity now. A valuable commodity because Dr. Bayou says the antibodies in my blood could hold the key to a potential vaccine, a new test, or treatment for the coronavirus. The fact that you've recovered from the illness and are no longer febrile means you, your body had gained the upper hand. The only way it would have done that would have been on a healthy immune response where you develop antibodies against it. Dr. Bayou then draws my blood. Okay. He'll submit a sample to a private lab, which will then use my plasma to identify the antibodies. This tube right here um, is going to have antibodies against COVID one of the most valuable things on the planet right now. Using antibodies is not new. It's an age old treatment used for decades to develop therapies which have been used to fight diseases like Ebola. So if the virus looks like this, your body is going to build an antibody against it. If it looks like that, like a lock and key. Mm -hmm. Now it's identified this as a foreign particle. Other elements of the immune system will come in to destroy the virus. Because we want the structure of that antibody because we cannot produce anything nearly as well as your body can that can fight this virus as that antibody. This past Monday, my test results returned and showed no signs of the virus. The American Red Cross is in the process of establishing a program to allow recovered patients to donate their plasma. 
If you're interested in donating, you can sign up using a link posted in this story on 11alive.com. So as we learn new things about the virus, the CDC and other health officials continue to update guidance about how to protect yourself and stop from spreading the disease to others. From studying cases in China, we also know a lot more about the timeline of symptoms and hospitalization. Data from one study shows that from the time symptoms start to about a week after the person will experience mild symptoms. For those whose symptoms get worse, day seven or eight is when they start experiencing that shortness of breath and will be admitted to the hospital around day 10 or 11 is when people with severe symptoms will be admitted to the ICU. And according to car cardiologist Dr. Paley Coley, they can stay in the ICU for up to two weeks. All of this new information can help us make sense of why the CDC continues to update its guidelines. A big change was when U.S. health officials told people they should start covering their face in public. Let's take a look at that timeline and why the recommendation changed. This is U.S. health officials advising against the general public wearing masks in early March. Should you wear a mask if you're healthy? No. There is no advantage to you wearing or buying a mask. Now states and the federal government are changing their tune on who should wear a mask. Wearing cloth face coverings in public settings where other social distancing measures are difficult to maintain. So, what's the deal with masks? To start, let's take a look at the CDC's initial guidelines on masks. It says the CDC does not recommend healthy people to wear a face mask. It should only be used by people who have COVID-19 and are showing symptoms. That sounds pretty straightforward, right? But how do you know if you are healthy? Well, from early on during the outbreak, we knew that some people who are infected with the virus may not show symptoms for up to 14 days. This is called the incubation period, and it's possible for someone to spread the virus even when they don't have symptoms. But we didn't quite know to what degree this occurs and how much it drives the outbreak. That's where countries diverged on their guidance on masks. U.S. health officials believe that asymptomatic spreading, which we've seen some evidence of, but not the major driver. You really need to just focus on the individuals that are symptomatic. Adding on top of that was the pragmatic concern that a run on masks could worsen the already severe shortage of medical supplies for hospitals and the fear that masks may give people a false sense of security. So the CDC decided not to embrace the mass public use of face masks. Meanwhile, the same evidence led health officials in Asia to a different conclusion. Countries started advising or even mandating that healthy people wear masks in crowded places, citing fear of asymptomatic transmission. As expected, the demand for masks in those places skyrocketed, causing an immediate shortage, which was eased by government intervention. And then... Now 80 cases in the U.S. 3,000. 16,000. More than 160,000 cases in the United States. More coronavirus cases than any country in the world. As the outbreak accelerated in the U.S., new cases of asymptomatic transmission challenged the reassuring message by health officials about the way the coronavirus spreads. COVID-19 is being spread by these silent spreaders. How can you tell people to only wear a mask if they're sick, if they don't know if they're sick? Evidence grew stronger suggesting asymptomatic transmission may be responsible for more cases than previously thought, eventually prompting the CDC to adopt new thinking about the benefits of masks. With the new data that there's significant asymptomatic transmission, this is being critically re-reviewed. One reason why some Asian countries have promoted the idea that the general public should wear masks from the beginning is likely because of their experience with SARS, a 2003 epidemic of a virus similar to the coronavirus and that spread mostly in Asia. One study found that always wearing a mask when going out was associated with a 70% reduction in risk. SARS also fundamentally changed how people in Asia view masks, removing the stigma of wearing masks in public. But the mask debate comes with two big caveats. First, there is still a dire shortage of personal protective equipment in hospitals across the country, putting medical workers at increased risk of contracting the virus. They're having us use the same mask between patients and using single-use masks up to five times or more. We desperately need to address that to give our frontline healthcare workers the best protection they deserve. And second, masks are not magic shields, and they cannot replace social distancing. Countries like South Korea that successfully flattened the curve did so by combining mask wearing with mass testing, social distancing, and rigorous contact tracing. Only by using a combination of methods and by working together can we effectively stop the spread of the coronavirus. Tonight, a story of hope nearly a year after a devastating car crash. A teen reached the major milestones in his recovery. His friends wanted to celebrate for his birthday. Matt Pearl explains how they got creative so they could be together at a safe distance. Here is where it starts. 18-year-old Holden Ludwig 
five days after graduating high school, one day after he was T-boned in his car and critically injured. You feel like you're in a dream. It's a lonely world when you're, you're healing like this um, for so long. Recovery takes community. Neighbors hung blue ribbons. His school held a candlelight vigil. Holden knew none of this. Doctors said he had suffered the worst kind of traumatic brain injury. His victories, months later, were a raised arm, a held hat. Recognition of what an object is. Nice job, Holden. All these little victories that seem so silly, like putting a hat on, are huge. By early October, Holden was talking. Lucky. You're very lucky. By early November, he was walking with plenty of help. You just gotta look at the positive side of literally even like the worst moment. His community behind him, Holden made progress at facilities across Atlanta until the COVID-19 outbreak forced him to stay home. We feel that loss right now, especially because they say um, that build up to the year is the most important part for brain injury recovery. It's a tenuous time, but last week brought Holden's birthday and he showed right away he won't slow down. That was so relieving. Good job. It made me feel more, way more functional than I have been. I'm looking pretty too. You look beautiful. And then all of a sudden this, you know, train of cars. <laughs> Holden's community came through with a drive through celebration. They all like drove by with their their cool cars. It made me super happy and excited, I'll tell you that. We're not getting through this without a fight. Waiting to see how far Holden goes. And and I don't I don't honestly think he's done. The coronavirus is forcing millions of people to stay home and it's leading to a disturbing trend. What's being done to help the victims next? It's been a nice day out there despite the wind. Temperatures have been comfortable and no rain in the area. And it looks nice right now at Truist Park. Stay with us. We'll take another look at this and let you know what to expect as we head into the weekend. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. 
Televised newscasts not enough for you? Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. We have been told by one area Atlanta hospital that they are seeing a 15% increase in domestic violence cases at their facilities. That was Governor Brian Kemp at a recent news conference saying while Georgia deals with the COVID-19 pandemic, a local hospital is seeing an increase in domestic violence cases. The governor's statement comes as a shock to even advocates who work to help domestic violence survivors. Reveal investigator Faith Abube explains. Sheltered in place. He also choked her. What was trying to fight her? My, my stepdad. In closed quarters with their abusers. Did he hit you anywhere else or just in the mouth? And frustrations running high. She's aggressive, wanting to fight. These are just a few of the Metro Atlanta domestic violence calls to 911 in the last few days. He wants to kill the lady. Are you the husband and the wife? I need somebody right away. Advocates say while Georgia is under a stay at home order, the risk for domestic violence is as real as it's ever been, if not more. It really does complicate things. Jan Christensen is the executive director of the Georgia Coalition Against Domestic Violence. It's not easy for people who live with somebody who can be potentially violent uh, to to have to stay in close quarters with them all the time and not be able to get out. Christensen's group is the umbrella agency for all domestic violence programs in the state of Georgia. Statewide, they expect Georgia's domestic violence problem to get worse during the COVID-19 pandemic. But she says they weren't expecting this. We have been told by one area Atlanta hospital that they are seeing a 15% increase in domestic violence cases at their facilities. In some ways, I'm almost surprised that a, a local hospital has seen a 15% increase in um, domestic violence cases only because um, I think that people are, survivors are going to find it harder to reach out and get help. In emails to 11 Alive, Governor Brian Kemp's office said in part, we're not going to get into additional specifics about the 15% increase the governor referenced. We went directly to area hospitals, law enforcement agencies, and advocates to find out what they're seeing. Atlanta's Grady Hospital, the largest hospital in the state of Georgia, told us we do not keep stats on domestic violence cases. Wellstar said, in light of the COVID-19 pandemic, we're not able to provide the information because it would need more research. The GBI said it doesn't keep that data. And Christensen says the state's domestic violence hotline hasn't even finished calculating its March data yet. Statistics tell us that when there is a national emergency or a local emergency, that um, calls for help like this may go down initially, only because people are trying to figure out how to navigate in the space with which they can. Regardless, Christensen believes the risk to domestic violence survivors is undeniable. I think that 15% could really be representative of a lot more that's going on out there. The condition might not be ideal, but Christensen wants victims to remember, even under a shelter-in-place order, help for domestic violence survivors is still only a call away. Even if somebody can't leave or isn't ready to leave or is afraid to leave, that there is going to be an advocate on the other end of the, of the phone uh, when you call that number. The Georgia Domestic Violence Hotline number is 1-800-334-2836. We were also able to get some data from APD, the Criminal Justice Coordinating Council, and the hotline for past years. You can find those in this story. Just head to 11alive.com. Hey, Chris. Hey, I hope you like this view that we're seeing right now, a live view from Truist Park looking over the stadium. And I want you to notice something here. Can you see the blue colors? That's because Truist Park, as well as many buildings around Metro Atlanta, maybe you've noticed some of those tonight, are lighting up in blue tonight to honor 
all of the front line people, the uh, workers who are like right on the front lines and dealing with this COVID crisis that is going on right now. So uh, they say they're going to do this every Thursday with that blue canopy. Oh, I just lost it here. Hold on. There we go. The blue canopy there with the lights. So uh, maybe you might be wondering why are some of these buildings all lit up tonight in blue? That is the reason why. That, that's really a nice view out there as well. Look at the pollen count today. This is something else nice about today. You know, we had those storms that came in overnight and early this morning. Then they moved out. We had windy conditions, but it was just such a nice, crisp, clean air. It seemed like out there today and fewer pol pollen particles per cubic meter of air. Today's pollen count 752 main pollens present mulberry, oak, pine, sycamore and also hickory. Mold is in the high range. A lot of people are impacted up by that. That gets me a lot of times when the mold is up. Here's a look at the trends that we've been going through this week. Monday, 2,500, 4,300 Tuesday, 3,100 Wednesday, and today, much lower. And I think we can attribute that to some of that rain that came in overnight that kind of washed a lot of that out. It's been windy today, and sometimes that stirs up more pollen, but it's also been cooler. So that kind of closes up some of those pollen spores. So it's going to be interesting to see what tomorrow's pollen count is. Look at these temperatures. We got up to the upper 70s today. Right now we're in the upper 60s. A little cooler up in North Georgia with some 50s there in Blairsville and Clayton. Lower to mid 60s here on the north side. And also south of us, we have some mid 60s in general in the area. Through the overnight hours, we're going to see these temperatures continuing to drop uh, down into the 40s. So we're going to be cooling off with that mixture of stars and just a few clouds out there during the nighttime hours. And then during the day tomorrow, warming up a little bit, but still it's gonna be below average. We're only gonna get up into the low to mid 60s tomorrow. Plenty of sunshine around, but it is gonna be feeling a lot cooler tomorrow compared to where we were today. So here's a look at the headlines of what we're gonna be watching over the next few days. Temperatures are cooling down. And we'll be feeling those cooler temperatures tomorrow and then Saturday morning, pretty chilly to start the day. And then we get back up to 70 on Saturday afternoon. And the first half of the weekend is going to be dry. So Friday, Saturday will be dry. It's on Sunday, excuse me, when those showers come back in. And there's even going to be the potential for some storms that will be rolling our way as well. So enjoy your Friday. It's going to be a nine on the wisometer. We're just keeping it at a nine just because those temperatures are a little bit cooler than average. Mostly sunny skies still looking pretty nice out there. There's that storm system coming in here. Saturday it's going to be well out to the west, but it does come our way on Sunday, increasing our chance for the potential for severe weather late Sunday into Monday. So dry weather the next couple of days, chilly Saturday morning, then we get up to 70. 71 Sunday with showers and storms overnight Sunday into early Monday as well, then clearing out. Looking dry Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, but a mix of sun and clouds with high temperatures in the upper 60s to right around 70 degrees. All right, thanks, Chris. Here are three stories you may have missed today. Georgia is pushing back its primary election last month. Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger delayed the presidential primary until May 19th, combining it with the regularly scheduled general primary. But now the election is moving to June 9th. The decision comes less than 24 hours after Governor Kemp extended the current public health state of emergency through May 13th. After a coronavirus induced hiatus, Saturday Night Live will air new content this week. The show will air remotely produced content in its usual Saturday time slot. However, it is not clear if the performances will be live. The CDC has loosened the rules to allow essential employees who have been exposed to the coronavirus to return to work. Under the new guidelines, people can only go back to work if they are experiencing no symptoms. They should also take their temperature before shifts, practice social distancing and wear face masks. Previously exposed workers were told to stay home for at least 14 days. Although thousands of people nationwide are being diagnosed with COVID-19, thousands more are recovering, like Atlanta native Billy Roberts. Roberts contracted the virus, and although it was a tough battle, he's now fully recovered. Our sister station in Sacramento has his story. My symptoms really lasted like 27 days. It was, it was a tough, tough fight. Billy sharing his story to help others. I was uh, at a practice football game, a flag football, and we, um, I just got really winded. And then I, the next day I got just a really high fever. So I went to the doctor and, um, and I, was having a, I was having a hard time breathing. They gave me their last test. They went through 25 and they, um, they gave me their last one. The results did not come back for another five days. Things took a turn for the worst. Billy had to go to the hospital. And I called my doctor because I was just, I just took my dog out and I literally couldn't get up the steps without, um, it felt like when you 
you breathed out okay, but when you breathed in, it felt like you were just trying to like pull up a 10 weight anchor. And um, I would get really dizzy and my fever was at 103. Billy's situation was complicated by his asthma. So day 10, I felt, I felt like I was getting better. I was like, thank God it's over. Like you do, you know, when you have a flu. And then for some reason, day 11, um, it's like my, my immune system attacked itself. It was like overcompensating. And, and that's when I just crashed. And I think that's what the danger is. Thankfully, Billy recovered and he has advice based on his experience. I would say um, to get one of these things that measures your oxygen, you can get them at CVS. And if your oxygen gets below 90, I would say immediately go to the hospital. He worries about asymptomatic spread. I came into contact with, you know, the gym. And that's the thing, like, you don't, you're not exhibiting symptoms, so you're exposing a lot of people. And I didn't know I had it until, you know, until I, it was too late and I was showing a fever and showing the signs. I think we all have to assume we have it because this virus is, is different. You know, you're you're giving it to other people when you have no symptoms, and then when you have symptoms, it's kind of too late. Virus-related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you? Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive. It's going to be a little on the cool side tomorrow. High temperatures near 64, but we'll have a lot of sunshine and just some breezes around. Chilly Saturday morning down to 41 with a high of 70. We're watching the storms coming in on Sunday. Some of those could turn severe late Sunday into early on Monday. Then it clears out on Monday with dry weather conditions Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. Highs back in the upper 60s to lower 70s. All right, thanks so much, Chris. Chris is going to take a quick break in the Basement Storm Tracker Center. I'm going to be coming up at 10 o'clock on prime time with Jeff, but stick around. Chris and I will be back with you on Uplate on our sister station, 11 Alive at 11 p.m. We'll see you then. It's a lot going on. Pick a time. We'll be there. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. 
Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff. 11 Alive News Primetime on the ATL starts now. It is the 17th Street Bridge, a live look toward the Atlanta skyline and the 14th Street Bridge, illuminated in blue tonight to support the thousands of healthcare workers that are trying to put away the pandemic, trying to keep lives with us. It is an extraordinary evening and uh, one that we are certainly uh, taking a look at tonight. But first, Georgia health officials are taking a closer look at race when it comes to patients with COVID-19. New data across the country shows African Americans may be dying from the virus at a higher rate. Ryan Kruger tells us it was the topic of a virtual town hall tonight. Here in DeKalb, we were the first to come up with the numbers that the nation is now speaking on. In a virtual town hall Thursday night, health officials talked about why they believe African Americans seem to be more vulnerable to COVID-19. Not everyone in this country has equal access to health. Public health officials in several cities like Philadelphia, Detroit, and Chicago say they're seeing the disproportionate impacts on the black community too. Experts say African Americans have higher rates of certain diseases like diabetes and hypertension, and this can lead to more severe cases of COVID-19. According to the latest numbers released from the Department of Public Health in Georgia, 21% of all patients are African American, while 16% are white. But the vast majority, 60%, aren't known. The state admitted they just recently started looking at race. So it's hard to make a, a, a firm analysis without consistent data. Public health officials say more research needs to be done, but one thing is for sure. I heard all kinds of different stories, and, and I'm sure you've heard them too, that this is not a black person's disease. Okay. None of that is true. 
all across the country, African Americans are making up about a third of all hospitalizations due to COVID-19, while only making up about 13% of the total population. All right, Ryan, so tell us, have most states followed Georgia's path and we're going to start uh, getting that data on race? Uh, actually, no. Georgia is one of the few. Right now, fewer than 10 states across the country, including the District of Columbia, are looking at race when it comes to COVID-19. But there is a national movement now, including from medical boards, to start looking into this data. All right. Thank you, Ryan. Out of 14 states studied, Georgia was sixth in line when it came to the number of confirmed cases based on limited testing. The numbers on age line up with what health officials have been telling us that older people and those with health conditions are most at risk. But younger people also are getting sick. 90% of those admitted to the hospital had underlying health conditions, but they are common conditions for Americans like high blood pressure and obesity. And many also had metabolic diseases like diabetes or chronic lung disease like asthma. The report also shows of those hospitalized, 45% were white, 33% were African-American, and to put this into context, the CDC says that black people accounted for just 18 percent of the population of the 14 states studied, so they are more impacted overall. At the state level, we still don't have a clear picture of which groups are most impacted. In the majority of cases in Georgia, some 60 percent, the Department of Public Health says the person's race is unknown. The state told us yesterday that's because doctors and labs have not been reporting that information to the state. DPH is now working to circle back to get that data and to make sure that they include all of those numbers from here on out. So it would be nearly impossible to find anybody at this point of the pandemic who has not been touched by, cor by uh, coronavirus. So many people hurting right now and uh, companies and businesses are forced to reduce hours or layoff. All right, so another chilling effect of the COVID-19 pandemic is the unemployment number. 6.6 .6 million Americans filed jobless claims last week. That's more than 16 million Americans in three weeks. The numbers seem mind boggling, but here they are. The losses in the past three weeks are staggering as restaurants, hotels and offices have shut down to combat the spread of the virus today. In his daily briefing, President Trump focusing on the long game. We have things in the works that are going to really, I think, fire the country. I think that what's going to happen is we're going to have a big bounce rather than a small bounce. But we will be back. But until that happens, the pain continues. Georgia's new claims for the week totaled more than 390,000, nearly triple the previous week's number. A silver lining. Some Georgians could see that additional $600 in unemployment from the federal stimulus bill as soon as next week. So many people are hurting right now. We're talking about the companies and businesses having to reduce hours and lay people off. But Congress is stuck when it comes to getting more money to those small businesses and even hospitals, along with state and local governments. Republicans in the Senate wanted to add $250 billion in stimulus money to support the Paytech Protection Program. Its goal is to support small businesses, but it could run out of money soon since so many businesses say they need help. Democrats have tried to secure additional funding for hospitals and local governments, but that's also hitting roadblocks. As Congress struggles to come up with a plan, we continue to see record breaking numbers of people filing for unemployment in Georgia. In one week alone, listen to this, our state processed more claims than it did in all of last year. It is one thing to file a claim and another to get the help in hand. So how fast is that relief coming? Joe Henke shares how two women had very different experiences. It is the tale of two women both filing for unemployment. Julie P. Warren lost her full-time job, immediately filed a claim, and received her first check almost right away. I didn't wait long at all. This, pro this time it actually went smoother. It took six weeks for her to see a check when she lost her job during the Great Recession. Julie is now receiving $275 a week after taxes. Meanwhile, Emily Mooneyhan says she filed for unemployment, received a confirmation letter, but weeks later, the grad student and mother has yet to receive a check. Oh, I can look at this letter and see that I am eligible uh, 
based on income. After Emily filed her claim, the state began requiring some employers to file claims for their employees, and Emily's employer then also submitted a claim. I've been able to get some help from my church, um, financially some help from my family. We called the Georgia Department of Labor today. A spokesperson said Emily's issue is one they are occasionally seeing. Two claims in Emily's name created a log jam and one needed to be cleared out. We are told Emily should now receive her first unemployment check. Julie and Emily are only two stories out of millions nationally. The U.S. Department of Labor reports record numbers of people filed claims in the past three weeks, adding up to 16 million plus claims. The trend is similar here in Georgia. Before the COVID-19 pandemic, around 5,000 people filed new claims each week. The State Department of Labor today announced it processed 390,000 claims last week alone, three times last week's total, and amounting to more claims than in all of 2019. Julie hopes to somehow find work soon as she is one major expense away from being unable to pay her bills. We're able to get my rent paid. I'll be able to keep food on the table, but I don't have any discretionary income to speak of. About a third of renters didn't make their payments this month, according to the National Multifamily Housing Council. An exclusive poll from Survey USA offers insight into how many people are struggling financially during this pandemic. More than half of the people surveyed say they were at least somewhat worried about missing this month's mortgage payment, and 62% of renters said the same. A few people also said they were seeing reduced hours at work, and 18% say they were laid off, while only a small percentage say they lost their job completely. People enrolled in the SNAP food stamp program are finding their options are limited when it comes to getting groceries. The governor has urged people to take advantage of online delivery, but online shopping with curbside pickup or home delivery isn't an option yet for people using EBT cards at major chains like Publix and Kroger. A national test program was launched in select states, but Georgia wasn't one of them. Kroger and Publix say they are working with state and federal officials to get the test program here, but for now, SNAP recipients will have to visit the stores to have the cards swiped. We have resources for those now facing unemployment, including a guide for how to file a claim and a list of companies that are hiring. You can find those in the As Seen on TV section of the 11 Alive app. Lysol wipes, they are gone. Hand soap, they are gone as well. How about toilet paper? Have you been successful finding any of that? If you've been shopping lately in the last couple of weeks, you know looking for those items is sort of like looking for gold or panning for gold. It's a picture of one of our investigative producers here. She went to six stores before finding a pack of toilet paper. Yes, it has really come to that. Some of you have asked us to find out why certain cleaning products and hand sanitizers are not being made quickly enough. New at 10, Hope Ford went right to the source to get information for you. A precious resource that is hard to find right now, hand sanitizer. Where is it? I talked to Rakesh Tamabatula about the shortage. He's the CEO of Quix Brands, which makes hand sanitizer. The quick answer, the ingredients to make the product, there's not enough. From the alcohol, from the polymers that are used to gel it, and including the plastic bottles that we use to package the, the product. Hand sanitizer is typically produced in small batches a month or two in advance. When it was wiped out, there wasn't enough ingredients to get large batches out. Tama Butala even says you can expect new batches to be in squeeze bottles because there's a shortage of pumps as well. It's not just sanitizer. Lysol wipes, Clorox products, which the Environmental Protection Agency says are the best way to prevent the spread of COVID-19, are also in short supply. USA Today reports it could be summer before you can easily buy them again. Same with hand sanitizer. But that doesn't mean companies aren't making the product at all. Most of the hand sanitizer that we have been producing, it has been going towards healthcare and uh, the, the essential workers. Old Fourth Ward Distillery is also making it for first responders. When hand sanitizer Sanitizer does become readily available again. Tama Butala warns against panic buying, which caused the shortages in the first place. I would suggest them to buy as they need. All right, so Hope Ward joins us now safely from home. Hope, tell us about those viral recipes we're seeing online. Can people just make their hand sanitizer right at home? So, you know, chemists and even Tama Butala are actually warning against those recipes. The CDC recommends that a hand sanitizer have at least 60% alcohol for it to be effective. So while you can make your own, you know, unless you get the right alcohol and you're mixing it 
perfectly, then you're risking what you're making not being very effective. And the concern there is it kind of gets gives a false sense of security. And we do not want that. Thank you so much. Great tips from Hope for tonight. People all over the world are showing support for health care workers. Next, the gift one metro neighborhood is offering them. Those temperatures cooling down out there tonight, and we're going to have a couple of cool mornings as this pattern is bringing in some of that, uh, that air that you can see here with our graphics. Stay with us. We'll let you know when we are going to warm back up and when we'll see the risk for storms. Speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. New tonight at 10, we're seeing people all over Metro Atlanta offering support to hospital workers, those who are trying their best to slow down this pandemic. These are people living in Spalding County neighborhoods now are giving from their hearts. John Sherrick shows us their gifts, and they're all tied up in red bows. As soon as you drive into this neighborhood in Griffin, you see them. Well, I think all of us just feel like we want to do something. On practically every mailbox. That little spark became a fire. It was Marjo Amlicker. We know people who have been directly affected with the virus or people who have passed away. Who put the word out to her neighbors. And right away, Denise Mitchell started making bows. And it just took off. They asked their neighbors, would you buy a red bow and display it for the patients, for the health workers? Within two days. We were covered up in red bows. They raised more than twelve hundred dollars. Uh, this means more to the team here than you will ever know. For dinners, they personally delivered, with help from the Eagles Landing Chick Fil A, to their nearby hospitals, for the nurses and doctors, for everyone trying to save lives. They were so thankful, and they kept saying that they were exhausted, but. They have something inside of them that keeps going. You know, they're never going to give up. Now other neighborhoods are putting in orders for red bows. Well, we still have donations coming in. Marjo and Denise say they're going to keep making the bows and keep donating dinners for as long as this takes. As we look at the bows, just remember them. It's a daily reminder of what everyone is going through. And a daily reminder of what so many are doing everywhere to help the helpers. After going through the past few days with temperatures that have been above the average, we're moving back into a below average period here just for a couple of days, especially the mornings are going to be kind of chilly. Take a look at the maps. Let me show you what we're watching. You can see in the upper level pattern here, that blue color indicating the colder air that's coming in from the north. We're going to be feeling that tomorrow. Uh, morning lows start off in the 40s and highs only in the 60s tomorrow compared to 78 that we had today for a high temperature. It'll stay cool, really chilly Saturday morning, and then we start warming back up Saturday afternoon. And then watch moving into Sunday, that colder air retreats. It's going to be warm again here on Sunday, 
and then that sets the stage as the next rain system moves in for the potential for storms late Sunday night and into, into early Monday as the next surge of cold air moves our way. And then we'll be feeling that into next week. And you can see Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. Again, those temperatures are going to be trending just a little bit below the average before we start warming up again by the end of next week. Here's a live look. This is at Truist Park. And you notice the colors there under the canopy, that blue color. We mentioned earlier in the story that uh, many buildings in Metro Atlanta have that those blue lights on to honor uh, all of those frontline workers, medical workers, and those who work in grocery stores who are there on the front lines. And they're going to do this every Thursday night with those blue lights. So it looks kind of cool out there with the canopy. 66 degrees right now here in Atlanta. We do have some mid and lower 60s on the north side, even 50s up in north Georgia. Then on the south side, a range of temperatures from the low 60s to the upper 60s. And it's going to be chilly going through the overnight hours. Watch these temperatures as they drop. Excuse me, as they drop. By tomorrow morning, we're down to 46 degrees. But look up in Blairsville and in uh, the Clayton area. Temperatures in the 30s there. That's going to be really chilly. And it's going to be even colder, we think, by Saturday morning as well. Once we get to the lunchtime hour tomorrow, we'll be back to the 50s and then topping off in the 60s here for tomorrow afternoon. We'll go with 64 degrees for a high temperature. That's after a morning low of 47. Going with a 9 on the wasometer. That's our scale from 1 to 11, where an 11 is a perfect day. Mostly sunny skies looking great. Just a little breezy and temperatures below where we should be for this time of year. We're watching the next system that's going to move our way with the severe weather threat. You just saw there on the maps Saturday. That's over into Texas. We're going to be fine here. It's on Sunday. As the system moves our way, uh, this is the day four outlook, all right? So we know that we're going to be fine-tuning this over the, over the next couple of days. The way it looks right now is that that um, uh, level three risk most likely is going to be in parts of areas south and west of Atlanta through southern, central and southern Alabama, central and southern Mississippi, and back into Louisiana as well. And Atlanta looks like it's going to be in that level two of five risk, that slight risk for severe storms. So Sunday is not only going to be wet, but also the potential for some storms. Here's how it looks early in the morning on Sunday. No rain around. That comes in through the day on Sunday. And then the storm risk looks like it's going to be a little more likely late, late Sunday into the overnight hours into early on Monday before everything moves out. And then that's going to be that next surge of colder air that moves our way. 64 for a high Friday, 70 on Saturday. That's after the chilly morning in the lower 40s. Easter Sunday, rain moves in, storms possible late Sunday into Monday before it clears out later Monday. Then drier weather conditions Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday with highs in the 60s and uh, near 70 degrees by Thursday. All right, let's check out your weather. Wow moment of the day. Violent weather rocked areas of eastern Arkansas overnight. Take a look at this video you are seeing right now of what appears to be a tornado take out power lines, causing massive flashes in the night sky. At least 31 homes suffered severe damage from flattening, thinking of all of those families impacted there. Well, we want to see your weather wow moments and the easiest way to share them is on the 11 Alive Storm Trackers Facebook group. Go request to join the group now and get those photos posted. Jeff. Coming up after the break, how one local neighborhood is helping senior citizens stay safe during the pandemic. National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. 
the things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday acts. You know, kindness goes a long way these days. It's as necessary as washing your hands and keeping our distance. Seniors in particular need our help to stay safe without feeling isolated. Elwin Lopez shows us how one local neighborhood is helping out. Brittany Eddy talks to us from Grady Hospital. She's a nurse practitioner who sees patient after patient with COVID-19. I mean, unfortunately, a lot of the patients that are coming in are so sick that sometimes there's not much that can be done for them. So it's just really important to me that we can just do everything that we can to keep people safe um, and healthy at home. Outside of the hospital, she's teamed up with the Kirkwood Neighbors Organization to help at-risk seniors by pairing them with a neighbor. So far, we have about 30 households that were we've identified, and we actually have more than 57 volunteers, which is great. She says it goes beyond just delivering groceries. It's also about providing a much-needed social safety net. You know that someone's thinking of them. Um, you know, it might just be a conversation. Kids may make notes and put them in their mailboxes. It's not the first time Kirkwood has rallied around its elderly neighbors. A KO committee has helped dozens pay for home repairs over the years. That's how Eddie and others are finding those most at risk and in need. While it's great to be on the front lines here at the hospital, my mind sort of thinks in a public health sort of way, and it's what can we do in the community to keep people safe and healthy in the community so that they don't have to come to the hospital. All right, it's time for me to head out to get ready for Uplate coming up on 11 Alive at 11 p.m. So join myself and Chris. We will be there. Jeff, I hand it to you. Aisha, thank you very much. Safe journey over to 11 Alive. We will see you in about 35 minutes or so. Coming up next on The Big 36, here's what we have for you. A story of perseverance, how an Atlanta native went from being hospitalized to making a full recovery from COVID-19 sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. 
We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick cover your cough or sneeze. As we learn new things about this virus, the advice that we are hearing is ever evolving. The news from the CDC and other health officials are trying to give all of us guidance about how we can stay safe and healthy through all of this. And it has been ever evolving over the last three weeks. From studying cases in China, we also know a lot more about the timeline of symptoms and hospitalization. Data from one study shows that from the time the symptoms start to about a week after the person will experience mild symptoms. For those whose symptoms get worse, day seven or eight is when they begin experiencing shortness of breath and they will be admitted to the hospital. Around day 10 or 11 is when people with severe symptoms will be admitted to the ICU. And according to experts, they can stay in that ICU for up to two weeks. Now, all of this information can certainly make sense of why the CDC continues to update these guidelines. And there is a big change when U.S. health officials told people that they should start covering their face in public. So let's take a look at the timeline and why that recommendation has now changed. This is U.S. health officials advising against the general public wearing masks in early March. Should you wear a mask if you're healthy? No. There is no advantage to you wearing or buying a mask. Now states and the federal government are changing their tune on who should wear a mask. Wearing cloth face coverings in public settings where other social distancing measures are difficult to maintain. So, what's the deal with masks? To start, let's take a look at the CDC's initial guidelines on masks. It says the CDC does not recommend healthy people to wear a face mask. It should only be used by people who have COVID-19 and are showing symptoms. That sounds pretty straightforward, right? But how do you know if you are healthy? Well, from early on during the outbreak, we knew that some people who are infected with the virus may not show symptoms for up to 14 days. This is called the incubation period. And it's possible for someone to spread the virus even when they don't have symptoms but we didn't quite know to what degree this occurs and how much it drives the outbreak. That's where countries diverged on their guidance on masks. U.S. health officials believe that asymptomatic spreading, which we've seen some evidence of, but not the major driver. You really need to just focus on the individuals that are symptomatic. Adding on top of that was the pragmatic concern that a run on masks could worsen the already severe shortage of medical supplies for hospitals and the fear that masks may give people a false sense of security. So the CDC decided not to embrace the mass public use of face masks. Meanwhile, the same evidence led health officials in Asia to a different conclusion. Countries started advising or even mandating that healthy people wear masks in crowded places, citing fear of asymptomatic transmission. As expected, the demand for masks in those places skyrocketed, causing an immediate shortage, which was eased by government intervention. And then now 80 cases in the U.S. 3,000, 16,000, more than 160,000 cases in the United States. More coronavirus cases than any country in the world. As the outbreak accelerated in the U.S., new cases of asymptomatic transmission challenged the reassuring message by health officials about the way the coronavirus spreads. 
COVID-19, it's being spread by these silent spreaders. How can you tell people to only wear a mask if they're sick, if they don't know if they're sick? Evidence grew stronger suggesting asymptomatic transmission may be responsible for more cases than previously thought, eventually prompting the CDC to adopt new thinking about the benefits of masks. With the new data that there's significant asymptomatic transmission, this is being critically re-reviewed. One reason why some Asian countries have promoted the idea that the general public should wear masks from the beginning is likely because of their experience with SARS, a 2003 epidemic of a virus similar to the coronavirus and that spread mostly in Asia. One study found that always wearing a mask when going out was associated with a 70% reduction in risk. SARS also fundamentally changed how people in Asia view masks, removing the stigma of wearing masks in public. But the mask debate comes with two big caveats. First, there is still a dire shortage of personal protective equipment in hospitals across the country, putting medical workers at increased risk of contracting the virus. They're having us use the same mask between patients and using single-use masks up to five times or more. We desperately need to address that to give our frontline healthcare workers the best protection they deserve. And second, masks are not magic shields and they cannot replace social distancing. Countries like South Korea that successfully flattened the curve did so by combining mask wearing with mass testing, social distancing, and rigorous contact tracing. Only by using a combination of methods and by working together can we effectively stop the spread of the coronavirus. We have been told by one area Atlanta hospital that they are seeing a 15% increase in domestic violence cases at their facilities. That was Governor Kemp had a news conference yesterday saying while Georgia deals with COVID-19 in the pandemic, a local hospital is seeing an increase in domestic violence cases. The government statement came as a shock, came as a surprise to even advocates who work to help the violence survivors. Here's 11 Alive investigator Faith Abube. Sheltered in place. He also choked her. Who was trying to fight her? More, more fit, yeah. In close quarters with their abusers. Did he hit you? They were elder just in the mouth. And frustrations running high. She's aggressive, wanting to fight. These are just a few of the Metro Atlanta domestic violence calls to 911 in the last few days. He wants to kill the lady. Are you the husband and the wife? I need somebody right away. Advocates say while Georgia is under a stay-at-home order, the risk for domestic violence is as real as it's ever been, if not more. It really does complicate things. Jan Christensen is the executive director of the Georgia Coalition Against Domestic Violence. It's not easy for people who live with somebody who can be potentially violent uh, to to have to stay in close quarters with them all the time and not be able to get out. Christensen's group is the umbrella agency for all domestic violence programs in the state of Georgia. Statewide, they expect Georgia's domestic violence problem to get worse during the COVID-19 pandemic. But she says they weren't expecting this. We have been told by one area Atlanta hospital that they are seeing a 15% increase in domestic violence cases at their facilities. In some ways, I'm almost surprised that a, a local hospital has seen a 15% increase in um, domestic violence cases only because um, I think that people are, survivors are going to find it harder to reach out and get help. In emails to 11 Alive, Governor Brian Kemp's office said in part, we're not going to get into additional specifics about the 15% increase the governor referenced. We went directly to area hospitals, law enforcement agencies, and advocates to find out what they're seeing. Atlanta's Grady Hospital, the largest hospital in the state of Georgia, told us we do not keep stats on domestic violence cases. Wellstar said, in light of the COVID-19 pandemic, we're not able to provide the information because they would need more research. The GBI said it doesn't keep that data. And Christensen says the state's domestic violence hotline hasn't even finished calculating its March data yet. Statistics tell us that when there is a national emergency or a local emergency, that um, calls for help like this may go down initially, only because people are trying to figure out how to navigate in the space with which they can. Regardless, Christensen believes the risk to domestic violence survivors 
is undeniable. I think that 15% could really be representative of a lot more that's going on out there. The condition might not be ideal, but Christensen wants victims to remember, even under a shelter-in-place order, help for domestic violence survivors is still only a call away. Even if somebody can't leave or isn't ready to leave or is afraid to leave, that there is going to be an advocate on the other end of the, of the phone uh, when you call that number. We want to give you the number for the Georgia Domestic Violence Hotline. It is 1-800-334-2836. And we were also able to get some data from APD, the Criminal Justice Coordinating Council and the hotline for the past few years. We have all of those numbers and all of that data and information for you on 11alive.com. Although thousands of people nationwide are contracting COVID-19, there are also those stories of thousands of people who have beat this virus. One such case is Atlanta native Billy Roberts, now living in California. He contracted the virus, and although it was a very tough battle for him, finally he is fully recovered. Our sister station has more on his saga, on his story, from Central California. My symptoms really lasted like 27 days. It was, it was a tough tough fight. Billy sharing his story to help others. I was uh, at a practice football game, a flag football, and we, um, I just got really winded. And then I, the next day I got just a really high fever. So I went to the doctor and, um, and I, was having a, I was having a hard time breathing. They gave me their last test. They went through 25 and they, um, they gave me their last one. The results did not come back for another five days. Things took a turn for the worst. Billy had to go to the hospital. And I called my doctor because I was just, I just took my dog out and I literally couldn't get up the steps without, um, it felt like when you, you breathe out, okay, but when you breathe in, it felt like you were just trying to like pull up a 10 weight anchor and um, I would get really dizzy and my fever was at 103. Billy's situation was complicated by his asthma. So day 10, I felt, I felt like I was getting better. I was like, thank God it's over. Like you do, you know, when you have a flu. And then for some reason, day 11, um, it's like my my immune system attacked itself. It was like overcompensating. And, and that's when I just crashed. And I think that's what the danger is. Thankfully, Billy recovered. And he has advice based on his experience. I would say um, to get one of these things that measures your oxygen, you can get them at CVS. And if your oxygen gets below 90, I would say immediately go to the hospital. He worries about asymptomatic spread. I came into contact with, you know, the gym. And that's the thing, like, you don't, you're not exhibiting symptoms, so you're exposing a lot of people. And I didn't know I had it until, you know, until I, it was too late and I was showing a fever and I was showing the signs. I think we all have to assume we have it because this virus is, is different. You know, you're, you're giving it to other people when you have no symptoms. And then when you have symptoms, it's kind of too late. We have dry weather conditions out there right now, but we're looking around the southeast and we see some rain that is out along the Gulf Coast region. Stay with us. We'll let you know if that's going to have any impact on us as we finish up the week and head into the weekend. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus-related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you? Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. 
Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended. Tonight we have a story of hope. Nearly a year after a devastating car crash, a teen has now reached some major milestones in his recovery. His friends wanted to celebrate for his birthday, but as Matt Pearl explains, COVID-19 has made it difficult on everybody. Here is where it starts. 18-year-old Holden Ludwig. Five days after graduating high school, one day after he was T-boned in his car and critically injured. You feel like you're in a dream. It's a lonely world when you're, you're healing like this um, for so long. Recovery takes community. Neighbors hung blue ribbons. His school held a candlelight vigil. Holden knew none of this. Doctors said he had suffered the worst kind of traumatic brain injury. His victories months later were a raised arm, a held hat. Recognition of what an object is. Nice job, Holden. All these little victories that seem so silly, like putting a hat on, are huge. By early October, Holden was talking. I'm lucky. You're very lucky. By early November, he was walking with plenty of help. You just got to look at the positive side of literally even like the worst moment. His community behind him, Holden made progress at facilities across Atlanta until the COVID-19 outbreak forced him to stay home. We feel that loss right now, especially because they say um, that buildup to the year is the most important part for brain injury recovery. It's a tenuous time, but last week brought Holden's birthday, and he showed right away he won't slow down. That was so relieving. Good job. It made me feel more, way more functional than I have been. I'm looking pretty too. You look beautiful. And then all of a sudden this, you know, train of cars. <laughs> Holden's community came through with a drive-through celebration. They all like drove by with their, their cool cars. It made me super happy and excited, I'll tell you that. We're not getting through this without a fight. Waiting to see how far Holden goes. And, and I, don't, I don't honestly think he's done. All right, other news to talk about of a political nature. Georgia pushing back its primary election. Last month, Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger delayed the presidential primary until May 19th. 
combining it with a regularly scheduled general primary. But now the election is moving to June 9th. The decision comes less than 24 hours after Governor Kemp extended the current public health state of emergency through May 13th. The CDC has loosened the rules to allow essential employees who have been exposed to the coronavirus to return to work. Under the new guidelines, people can only go back to work if they are experiencing no symptoms. They should also take their temperatures before shifts, practice social distancing, and wear face masks. Previously exposed workers were told to stay at home for 14 days. After a coronavirus-induced hiatus, Saturday Night Live will air new content this week. The show will air remotely produced content in its usual Saturday time slot. However, it is not clear if the performances will be live. Well, some of the storms that came in overnight and early this morning helped us out a little bit with the pollen count. Take a look at it, and you can see that we're back to below 1,000. In fact, the pollen count for today, 752. The main pollens present are mulberry, oak, pine, hickory, and sycamore. Uh, grasses are in the low end. We don't have any weed pollen right now, but the mold is back up in the high range. So if those are your allergens, you may be feeling some of the impacts from that. Here's a look at some of the trends with that. You know, Monday, our pollen count was in the 2500 range. Then on Tuesday, it went way up to 4300. Wednesday, back down to the 3000s. And then today, from the extremely high range, back down to the high range. So that's something to celebrate. And you could almost feel the cleaner air out there today after the rain came through and we had that wind uh, kind of blowing uh, that moisture out in the cooler air in here. In fact, we had a high today of 78 degrees. That was really nice and that's still above the average. 71 is where we should be for this time of year. So we were seven degrees above average. But as that northwest wind continues to move in here, that's going to keep pushing in some cooler air. And this morning's low was 62. We're going to be down into the 40s tomorrow morning. So that's going to be a big difference out there. So maybe you're looking for a reason to get outside. You're tired of helping with the kids uh, with their homeschooling. You're working from inside, so here's some excuses to get outside during the day tomorrow. Maybe at mid-morning recess with the kids, you know, they, they need to get outside and stretch their legs and get, legs and get some exercise. But at around 10 o'clock, it's still going to be cool at about 49 degrees, so just keep that in mind if you have that planned. A backyard lunch tomorrow, still on the cool side, temperatures around 54 degrees, but it will be mostly sunny, looking pretty nice. And uh, maybe that late afternoon Zoom call, you want to take that outside as well. It's going to be dry out there and more comfortable in the afternoon. But temperatures are still going to be below average. We'll be around 64 degrees. Remember, we're supposed to be around 71 for this time of year. Now, moving into the weekend, we're going to be fine here on Saturday. All right, dry weather conditions here. But look out to the west. And you see that big yellow area in parts of Texas moving into Louisiana? That is the next severe weather threat that is going to be moving through the Texas area. And then by Sunday, that moves over toward the east. And it even enhances a little bit. And in fact, that orange color you see there is the enhanced risk or the level three of five risk that's going to be over much of Louisiana central and southern Mississippi and Alabama, and areas south and west of Atlanta. And in Atlanta, we think we're going to be in that level two of five risk, that slight risk for a chance for some scattered strong thunderstorms that could turn severe. Right now, the wind threats look like they're the main, main threats here. And just know this is the fourth day out, and um, this is going to be fine-tuned over the next few days is that enhanced risk versus the slight risk. In fact, here's the European model. You can see those showers as they move in on Sunday. First part of the day looks like general rain. And then late in the afternoon, uh, really evening and overnight into Monday morning, that's when it looks like there's going to be that better severe weather risk and really windy conditions. Is going to be, those will be the main issues before everything moves out later in the day there on Monday. So here's what we're watching with that seven-day outlook, 64 for a high Friday, uh, 70 on Saturday, 71 on Sunday uh, with those showers and storms ending on Monday, then drying out Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday with high temperatures in the upper 60s to right around 70 degrees. Stadium cities all over the world, including Atlanta, lighting it blue tonight to honor health care workers and to thank them for all they are doing. We, too, say thank you for all of those who are fighting this invisible virus on the front lines.
All right, let's talk about some sports news. The NBA sent out a league memo saying they were going to pay all of their athletes on time this week. But the future is still up in the air. The games are postponed indefinitely. So they want to, they want to create some sort of competition that will sort of turn the fans on. Uh, could ideas like horse fix some of this timeline? Here's Alex Glaze with more. The NBA announced eight NBA and WNBA players and legends will participate in a televised horse challenge. We all played it on, on the schoolyard or in our hoop and in the driveway. To see NBA players doing it um, from their own homes, I guess, would be neat. But will fans be watching? We posted a poll on the 11 Alive Sports Twitter page for a couple of hours and asked fans if they'll be tuning in. The results show sports fans are split. I think the curiosity factor will be there, um, particularly if it's, if it's entertaining. You're looking for an escape. You know, you're bouncing off the walls inside your house, and you, do, you just want some, some sign of normalcy. Hawks point guard Trey Young is one of the NBA stars who will be participating in the horse challenge. And if you follow Trey on social media, you've likely already seen that he's been playing basketball with his friends and dog in his driveway regularly. So who has the advantage in this horse challenge? Is it legends of the game or young stars with fresh legs? I think it might go to the player who has the best home driveway advantage, if I can say. Because, uh, you know, they'll know their driveway. They can bounce it off, you know, the side uh, of the garage or something like that. The horse challenge starts on Sunday and will conclude with a championship game on Thursday night. Our backyard highlight tonight. How about Falcons quarterback Matt Ryan? Ryan trying to raise awareness for organizations providing relief for those impacted by COVID-19 and showing off some of his putting skills, putting right through the legs of one of his sons. Nicely done, nicely played. We'll take a break. We're back right after this. Break. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus-related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you? Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during prime time. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On well, that wraps it up for us tonight. We will be with you tomorrow night, same place. We are here on 11 Alive News prime time from 8 to 11 o'clock each and every night. And Chris will be with us, Aisha, 
Jennifer Bellamy and the whole crew. So have a great night, everyone. And over on 11 Alive right now is Up Late with Aisha and Chris. Have a you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your Racial divide, new on up late, Georgia leaders push to learn why black people are dying from coronavirus at higher rates. Cashing in, help is on the way to Georgians out of work. The new timeline of Uncle Sam giving you a few extra hundred bucks. Wiped out, where is the hand sanitizer? New tonight, why you might have